morning, church. How's everybody doing? You guys like the snow again? Yeah. All right, well, let's all rise as we go before the Lord in prayer. All right. Father God, we just come before you. We thank you so much for you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for our provision. Thank you for this day that we get to come into church. We get to come in this building and be the church and just sing prayers to you and honor you as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The first and the last, you're just everything to us. Thank you so much for your creation that we get to enjoy every day. May we keep our eyes on you as our creator. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you. Thank you for giving us your one and only son. That you would freely go to the cross for each one of us so that we can have eternal life with you. Thank you for all that you're going to do this week in our lives and all that you do today. And that you'll continue. May we continue to look up to you. May we love you more this year than we did last year. And may things just start to come together. I lift those who are hurting, God. We lift um, those who have lost loved ones. Um, and we just thank you that we have a blessed hope that we can look to. And so, therefore, um, there's something to look forward to. It's not just all gloom. So thank you for using this. Thank you for your faithfulness. Even when we're not faithful. That's what your word says. You're faithful even when we're not. So thank you for your favor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
thank you so much, worship team, for leading us this morning. I'm going to invite our children to be making their way up to the front. We're going to be praying for them in just a minute. Um, as they're doing that, I want to mention just a couple of things. Um, please read your announcements. A lot of uh, important announcements there. But um, for those who um, signed up to get tickets to The Chosen, um, today is the last day to pay for those tickets. And so if you could see Perry, and he will make sure um, that's taken care of. But you need to take care of that today. Today is the last day to do that. So see Perry. And then again, some other sign-up lists, good things. Our Monday Night Fellowship, men and women's uh, Bible studies are happening. And then um, some, some know, but we wanted to let everybody be aware that our our sweet sister, Mary Janice, passed away yesterday. And, you know, Mary has been suffering with cancer for a while, but um, we know where she is. And uh, we've got a great picture of when she was baptized. I was just thinking about that. It's so sweet. We know she's rejoicing right now, and so please uh, pray for the Mary's family and and again, we just, uh, we'll, we'll be letting everybody know we'll be having um, her funeral probably sooner than later, but we'll, we'll let everybody know when that's going to happen. So, um, and then also we wanted to please uh, pray our good brother, Gino Fulgencia, um, his, his wife, Cindy, also passed away recently. And so would you please pray for, pray for his wife, Gino's wife, Cindy, has passed away. Please pray for the family as well. So right now, let's uh, let's just join our hearts together as we look at all these beautiful children. Will you pray with me this morning? God, thank you that you are the giver of life, Lord. <coughs> and not just here, but also in eternity, Lord. And so, God, we just keep all of our hope and trust in you. We are so grateful, God, for these little ones, these children that I know are, we know are representing your children across the world today. And our heart goes out to them, God. Would you cover and protect them? Would you draw them near to yourself today? And God, for those that are most vulnerable, will you please protect them and save the children that every child born into this world will come to know you and love you and be with you for all eternity is our prayer, God. And we so bless the children in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you. Please be seated. you're getting your Bibles out, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4 in just a few moments. But I wanted to start out this morning, um, a lady went to her pastor and she said, I will not be attending church here anymore. And he said, may I ask why? And she said, well, I see people all the time during church on their cell phones during the service some are gossiping some just ain't living right and they're all just a bunch of hypocrites so I'm leaving and the pastor got very silent and he said okay he said but can I ask for you to do something for me before you make your final decision and she said sure what's that and he said I want you to take a glass of water a full glass of water I want you to walk around the church two times and don't, don't let the water fall out of the glass. And she said, okay, I can do that. She came back and he said, he said, it's done. He said, let me ask, I want to ask you three questions. Number one, did you see anybody on their cell phone? Two, did you see anybody gossiping? Three, was anybody living wrong? And she said, I didn't see anything. I was so focused on this glass so the water wouldn't fall out. <laughs> and he said, exactly. When you come to church, you should be just that focused on God so you don't fall. And I actually really appreciate that story because we know Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. So not following other Christians, we follow Jesus. And that's important because this year, like every year, we don't ever want to let our relationship with God be determined by how others relate with God. We need to focus on God. That's going to be the key this year, every year. Remember, Peter 
said, Jesus is our example, and we must, 1 Peter 2.21, follow in his steps. Follow in his steps. That's always going to be the key. So this year, again, just like every year, we know that Jesus Christ is always going to be the standard by which every man and woman will be measured. All that Jesus did on this earth, as recorded in the, in the Gospels, is a perfect, perfect model for all of us to follow today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes back. Now, remember this morning, one of the beautiful things about God is he didn't just tell us what to do. Jesus came to this earth, and he gave us an example. He gave us a model, and he said, by the way, I'm also going to give you a, a personal coach called the Holy Spirit who will live inside of you. So I'm not just telling you what to do. I'm going to model it for you, and I'm going to do it through you. So Jesus gave us our marching orders, which is important because our purpose this year, every year, is we look at those orders again, and we seek with all of our hearts to carry them out. So I'm going to ask you um, this morning, as you're getting your notes out, I really want you to... To participate, This is going to be a very practical message this morning, so I want you to participate in that. Um, there's going to be some places where you can fill in names and things and then uh, and, and pray with me in what we're going to be looking at. And I say that because the background of our study today is that Jesus, for about a year, has been going around, he's been healing, he's been doing miracles, he's been teaching others, and he's been doing ministry now for about a year. And so after about a year in Galilee, he goes to his hometown of Nazareth. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. This is a big deal. This is a really, really big event. He's coming home to his hometown. By now, many, many people have heard about him. He's been to Jerusalem. He's cleansed the temple. He's done miracles. So everybody knows this is Jesus. He's coming back and he's going back to his own synagogue. We could say his own church, if you will. And this is where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 4. Notice the Bible says this, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread to the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everybody praised him, and he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So this morning, picture in your minds, Jesus went there, right? Stands up to read, read the scriptures, because he's going to be the guest speaker this week, right? Jesus is the guest speaker. And it says that the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. It's actually chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. This is a, a prophecy saying that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is coming one day. And, of course, it's been written, we know, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. Jesus unrolls the scroll to this specific spot, and now to his hometown crowd— he reads from Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, and he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. Now, I think sometimes it's hard for us to really understand the extremely high drama of this moment. Because remember, this is over 2,000 years ago. We're in Jesus' hometown. But I want you to picture this because it's so important. Jesus gets up. He reads probably the most famous, popular passage about the coming of the Savior of the world, God's Son. And he finishes reading this. He sits down in front of everybody in his hometown. And he's saying to them, the Savior, long prophesied. You're looking at it. That's really what he said. I'm it. I'm the one. And I want you to try to take that in because can you imagine the shock? And again, we know Jesus has been doing miracles. He's a great teacher, right? A great leader. He's been healing people. But I want you to think as he, as he did that, the, the chatter that probably went out among the crowd. Wait a minute. This is the guy I grew up with. Right? We, we played in the streets together. He's, he's Mary and Joseph's kid. We all went to school together, and now at age 31, he's coming back after a year of ministry to his hometown. He says, oh, you know this part in the Bible where it says about the Savior of the world, the Messiah coming? I'm it. And remember that it sent shockwaves, shockwaves through the entire community. 
And as I mentioned, he was reading from Isaiah 61, and there's something very, very important to keep in mind. Jesus has been doing what this prophecy mentions for about a year. And that, that's really important because what we typically do as people, right, is, you know, we might stand up and make an announcement about what we're going to do this year or whatever, and then we go and do it. Jesus actually did the exact opposite. Jesus went out and he did what he speaks of here for about a year, and then he comes back and says, by the way, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm doing it. You know, we've all heard the phrase, practice what you preach. Right? Jesus did the opposite. He was now preaching what he was already practicing. So he was already doing these five things where he says, I came to preach the good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, release the oppressed. He said, I'm already doing these things. I'm preaching what I'm already practicing. So why would he do this? Jesus once again is demonstrating, I am who I said I am. I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. I am the Messiah. Let there be no doubt about it. Okay, let's kind of break down some of these categories of the people that Jesus came to help. Again, as we're going into a new year, very important that we um, look at this. So he mentions the poor, the brokenhearted, the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed. Why is this so important? Let's go back to the beginning. Peter, again, while in, in, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, following Jesus' steps. So, what would Jesus do? Notice what, not only what he did, but even more specifically, who did Jesus come to help? Let's look at that quickly. Number one, Jesus said, I came to preach the good news to the poor. Okay, the poor, who does that include? Well, remember, there are different kinds of poverty, right? We understand that. There's material poverty. Material poverty is still a major, major problem in the world today. Half the world, you realize that half the world is poor. You may not realize this, but of the, what, over 6 billion people in the world, half of the world, over 3 billion people live on less than $2 a day. Okay, the poorest of the poor in America would be considered filthy rich compared to the rest of the world. So there's, there's that material poverty, but there's also a moral poverty. Moral poverty is when you have a lack of integrity. It's when you have a lack of the knowledge of right and wrong. It's when you've lost your, your moral compass. And we know there are many people today who have moral poverty. In fact, many have no morals at all. And the Bible is saying Jesus came to help them, to show them, guess what? There is a right and there is a wrong. There is truth. In fact, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the third kind of poverty is spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty is when you don't know what God planned for your life. And while sadly, while half the world is materially poor, most of the world is spiritually poor. In that they don't know the good news. They don't know that they're not an accident. They don't know that God made them for a purpose, that they were made to last forever. They don't know that Jesus Christ came to die for their sins so they could go to heaven. That is what we call spiritual poverty. The poverty of being unloved. The poverty of loneliness. Now, the second group Jesus said he came for is the brokenhearted. So he said, I came to heal the brokenhearted. By the way, the phrase broken heart, do you realize where that came from? It came from the Bible. When, when you hear that phrase, when, when you say, you hear people say, it broke my heart, that's actually a Bible phrase. Thousands of years old. In Psalm 69, 20, David said, insults have broken my heart. And that's one of the first uses of this whole idea of the broken heart. It comes from the Bible. Jesus said, I came for people who are brokenhearted. God, by the way, said, the Bible says is close to the brokenhearted. So that's the next group. Third group that Jesus came for, the imprisoned. Right? He said, I came to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Now, this is referring to people who are shut out, locked up in life. They're imprisoned in some way. And, of course, Jesus, I think, was also thinking and mentioning about, you know, people in physical prisons as well. In fact, we know the Bible tells us as believers we're to visit those in prison. We're to pray for people in prison. But remember as well, there are a lot of other kinds of prisons. The Bible talks about the kind of prisons that sometimes we put ourselves in, right? Um, one of them is addictions. Addictions, compulsions will imprison us. So when you hear people say, I feel trapped. 
Even when they use that word, they're talking about being in prison. Jesus said, I want to give them release. Now, another thing that imprisons us are secrets. When you have secrets that you don't feel that you can tell, when you have personal secrets that you don't feel you can share, th those will lock you up in a prison. You hold them inside of you, which is why, remember, the Bible tells us in James we're to confess our sins to God, but not just to God, we're to confess our sins to each other. But I would say on top of that, probably one of the number one thing that imprisons so many people today is fear. Our fears will put us in prisons that keep us, prevent us, hinder us from becoming all that God wants us to be. And that leads to number four. The fourth kind of people Jesus came for was the blind. Once again, do you realize right now in the world there are 50 million people, over 50 million people who are physically blind? God cares about those people. He wants to help them. He wants to heal them. But as we know, there's more than just physical blindness. There's what we could call relational blindness, right? Relational blindness is we, you don't see your own self-defeating behavior. You, you, don't, you don't get it. But here's the good news. Jesus said, I came for you as well. I came to help you out. And then there's another kind of blindness, the worst kind, spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness is when we close our eyes to the goodness of God. Spiritual blindness is when you don't realize how much you've messed up, but even worse, you're not willing to admit it. You're not willing to admit that you need a Savior, how much you need God in your life, and so you don't open your heart to Christ. That's spiritual blindness, but Jesus says, guess what? I care about you. I came to open up your eyes, to open up your heart, to give you a new vision and a new insight. And then number five, the last group Jesus said I came to help is the oppressed. He said, I came to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, again, all kinds of oppression in our world today that Jesus cares about. He wants to stop physical, mental, educational oppression, all kinds of oppression that he wants to help, but especially spiritual oppression. So I want us to pause for a moment and just reflect. Here we are right now, all of us, right? We're in this brand new year. The Bible says what? Jesus is to be our model for everything we do, both individually and collectively as a church. Now let me remind you, following in Jesus' footsteps, following his model, anybody if you're here, especially if you're new to the vineyard, you need to realize that will always, always be our vision here at Vineyard Christian Fellowship Chapel. Amen. Everything we do, it's not based on what some denomination thinks or what some top pastor thinks or what somebody else thinks. No, we just want to do what Jesus would do. We want to follow in his footsteps. And Jesus, in Luke 4, in fulfillment of Isaiah 61, said, I came to do these five things. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I've done for you. So Jesus is reminding us again this year of 2020. 20, 2020. That was a bad year. 2024. I, I want to delete 2020 out of my mind. This year of 2024, the same people who were hurting well over 2,000 years ago, you can find them in Santa Fe County. In fact, you can find them in every county in our country and our world. So this morning, this new year, how do we follow in his steps? It's actually not, it's not rocket science. We do what he did. So what are our marching orders for this year? I want us, again, to get very practical. Because if you want to help people in your life this year, which should be all of our heart's desire, if you want to be Christ-like, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want God's favor, then you do these five things that Jesus did, right? Very crucial. If our church, by the way, also wants God's blessing and favor, we must do these things that Jesus did, follow in his steps. So if there was anything more important to do, believe me, Jesus would have said it and done it. But this is what matters most. He says these five things. This is what Jesus came to do. So get your pen and paper out on your outline. You'll notice there's five actions that I'm going to ask you to do. You'll see a blank somewhere by each. Write down. Really, I want you to be thinking and praying even now of a person that is going to fit into this category, categories that we're going to look at. So, the first thing Jesus came to do, the Bible says, is preach the good news to the poor. 
And again, I mentioned the different kinds of poverty, but everybody, everybody needs the good news of Christ. So that means, first and foremost, this year, God wants you and I to proclaim, to communicate, to tell the good news, because anybody who doesn't know the good news of Christ is poor, right? They are in poverty. The worst of all poverty is not knowing Jesus. So this year, more than anything else you, that you might do for the people around you, God says, I want you to share the good news. Why? Because Jesus is the answer to every one of our problems. So what is the good news? You're not an accident. You were made to last forever. God made you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit wants to live in you. Your sins can be forgiven. You don't have to earn your way to heaven. Jesus will give you your, your present purpose for living, and he'll give you a future home in heaven. That's the good news. God says, I want you to share that. So right now, as I say that, I want you to think about somebody that you know in your life right now. And we all know somebody who is not walking with the Lord right now. Could be a brother, could be a sister, could be a mom, dad, husband, wife. Somebody, a friend, a co-worker, they need to know the good news. Who hasn't made, hasn't stepped across the line yet that you know? I want you to write their name down as we pray right now this morning. Will you pray with me? God, right now, even in this moment, Lord, we're asking you, God, would you please bring to our hearts and our minds that someone or, or, or just people, Lord God, that we know need to know about you. And God, we want them to know you this year. Would you help us to share your good news with them in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. All right, second thing Jesus came to do, and he wants us to do, is I want you to heal, I want you to comfort the brokenhearted. All right, hurting people, discouraged people, friends, neighbors, they're everywhere, right? They're all around us right now. As a pastor, now for well over 30-some years, I always know one thing for certain. Everybody, and I mean everybody, has a wound inside of them. Usually many. Everybody has these wounds. So, again, I want you to take out your, your pen or pencil. I want you to think of somebody in your life right now, even as you're thinking, who you know is going through a hard time. They're hurting. They're discouraged. They are, they are brokenhearted. Again, family member, relative, co-worker, somebody who has a broken heart, which, by the way, a broken heart, there is, there's actually a thing called broken heart syndrome. Yep. Doctors have it where you have, you, you're so hurt, you're so discouraged, you actually sometimes have a heart attack because you're so in despair. Again, there's people like that all around right now. Will you get that person in your mind who you know needs a good word, needs that encouragement? Let's pray right now. God, right now, once again, in this moment, would you bring to our mind and our hearts that person or persons who right now are just discouraged. They're broken. They are truly brokenhearted. God, would you help us to do all we can this year to reach out to them, to minister to them, to encourage them, to love them, that they'll know that they truly are loved by you. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So write that name down. Third thing Jesus said I came to do and I want you to do is that I came to proclaim freedom to those who feel imprisoned. Now, right away you might be thinking, I don't know anybody in prison right now. Okay, let me use a different word. Have you ever heard anybody said, as I mentioned before, I'm really feeling trapped right now. I'm really feeling stuck. That's called a prison. And there are people right now who are feeling trapped Maybe in a relationship. There are people right now who are feeling trapped by a bad habit. There are people right now who are feeling trapped by their finances. Some are feeling trapped by their health. There are some people who are trapped by their secrets. There are people who are feeling trapped by their past. And, and those people who are feeling trapped by their, their circumstances, the problem they're facing right now. They're all over the place. Everybody feels this. So once again, I want you to think of a person or person who you know is feeling trapped in prison. They may be literally in, in prison or in jail, but let's pray for them right now as well. Will you pray with me again? So once again, Lord, we are just calling on you. Would you bring to our mind and our heart somebody we know, Lord, and somebody in our sphere of influence, Lord, that is feeling just trapped, Lord, in prison in some way. And would you help us, God, 
to be able to minister to them that they could experience your freedom, that they could be set free to just know you and love you. Would you help those right now that are in prison, God, that we know, and help us to reach out to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Number four, Jesus said, I came to proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. So God says part of Jesus' ministry, ministry of recovery, right? He says, I want to help people recover their sight. Now think about that. What does that mean? It means that you and I must be willing to offer insight to people who might be physically, spiritually, relationally blind. What does the Bible say? The truth will set you free. free. So how do, you, how do you help blind people see the faults in their life? How do you help people see that they're messing up? Here's how you do it. Understand very clearly. Here's how it happens. You tell them the truth in love. That's what God says. And again, this might be the hardest thing to do of all of these, but it's the most loving thing to do. Remember, sometimes a surgeon has to cut in order to heal. So how many times have you seen a friend, have you seen a loved one, brother, sister, parent, friend at work, and you're, you're watching them, and they're getting ready to make a really, really bad mistake, a really bad choice. Something It could be like, you know, I'm going to leave my husband, or I'm going to leave my wife. Well, God wants me to be happy, and we don't say a word. Love, the Bible says, tells the truth. Love cares enough to say, no, I'm going to do everything I can to help you not ruin your life, not blow your life. I'm not going to let you make this, this bad choice that you're making. Don't take those drugs. Don't accept that decision. Don't move in with that person that you're not married to. You say, wait a minute, that's none of my business. It is your business if you care. It's not, it's not love when you stay silent. It's apathy. And Please hear me this morning. I'm not talking about judging and condemning people. I'm talking about doing what Jesus did, which is telling the truth in love. Not pointing a finger at someone. You sinner. You sin. We're all sinners. Point the finger back at you. Okay. We all, we're called just to speak the truth in love because love helps the blind to see the truth. And sometimes the most loving thing you can do is go to that person in your family or wherever who's manipulating everybody and maybe has been doing it for generations and say, you need to stop that. You need to cut it out. We're not going to let you do this anymore. You're not going to manipulate. There's going to be some boundaries here. That's called love. And I'm telling you, Jesus came to provide recovery of sight to the blind. So once again, stop and think right now the person in your sphere of influence that you need to tell the truth to in love. In love. And if there isn't somebody, great. But pray and see if there might be somebody right now who's just being blind to the effect of their actions. They don't see it. They don't see what it's doing to their kids. They don't see what it's doing to you and others. You help them get the truth in love, not condemnation, in love. Why? The truth will set us all free. So let's pray. Lord God, right now, would you help us? Would you bring to our mind and our hearts that person or persons right now, God, that needs the love of truth spoken into their life? Because, God, we, we don't want to see people making bad choices that will lead them away from you. We don't want people making decisions that are going to hurt others. So, God, help us in love to do that. So bring to our mind that person, God, we ask and, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the fifth area, God says, I want you to care about this year. He said, I want you to release the oppressed. So God is saying, I want you to care about those people in your life that are being kicked around, knocked around, picked on, put down. So stop and reflect for a minute. Do you know anybody like that? Maybe it's your workplace. And uh, maybe at school, a neighborhood, or whatever. And you know what I'm talking, maybe in your family. And you know what I mean when I say that? It's like everybody's always piling on them. They're always the easy target. They're, they're joked about either in their presence or behind their back. They're ridiculed. Um, and it, it just needs to be dealt with. The Bible says we're to release the oppressed. We're to help people who are put down and taken for granted, made fun of the vulnerable. Nobody has their back. And by the way, I would put at a very high, high
top of the list, children. There are many children right now we know that are being oppressed. Many we know, sadly, what breaks my heart every day is the human trafficking that's going on of children. As a church, should we be, be concerned about that? Should we be trying to help with that? And by the way, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to bring it up because we actually have a connection with a, a group here in Santa Fe that helps with human trafficking, and they always they need people to help. They need a church like ours. In fact, we have connected in a way where some people that are, are rescued out, out of human trafficking, they're rescued literally with just the clothes on their back. They don't have any clothes. They don't have a toothbrush. They don't have... Couldn't we help even in something like that? We could provide that, connect with them. They, they've sometimes, that, that this one group, they recommend them to come to our church, and we've, we've connected. We've helped some get back with their families and things like that. But we want to do that anymore, anymore. But again, it's, it's really helping people be released that are, that are being oppressed, and there are so many. So many that are in that part. And I'm really what we're talking about right now, please remember, this is the heart of Christianity. This is the core of our faith. This is what God wants us all to do. What did Jesus say in Matthew 25, you know, the judgment? He said, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. Sick and in prison, you visited me. And we'll say, when did we do that, Lord? And Jesus will say, when you did it to any of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So let's pray. Lord, right now, would you bring to our mind and our heart, God, somebody that we know that is being oppressed. They're being just made fun of. Lord, help us to step in, to be willing to step in and help that person or those people, Lord God. And particularly, we are praying for children, God. We are praying that, please, we could help these children that are being oppressed in our world right now. And right here in our city, would you help us, God? We lift them up to you. Help us this year to help the oppressed. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So remember Jesus' own words. He said, the doctor doesn't come for the healthy. Right? The doctor comes for those who are sick. So Jesus came for the sick. As I was going through this message, I wanted to kind of come up with a kind of a, a list of of what we've talked about in this message uh, that kind of contains all of it. Here's the list that I came uh, came up with. Are you ready? Kind of a modern day list. Jesus came for the chewed up, the crossed off, the crying out, the dropped out, the edged out, the freaked out, the have nots, the held back, the hung over, the knocked around, the left out, the loaded down, the looked over. Jesus came for the locked up, the led astray, the laid off, the let down. He came for the messed up, the mixed up, the passed over, the picked on, the pinned down, the pushed around, the put down, the ripped off. He came for the run over, the run down, the screwed up, the shrugged off, the shut in, the shut out. He came for the smashed up, the stacked against, the strung out. He came for the thrown away and the turned off and the used up and the walked over. He came for the washed out, the worn out, the wiped out, the written off. Does that get them all? I think we got them all in there. I think we got them all in there. And I want you to, to think about that because guess what? All that means he came for you and for me because we're all in that list right there. We're all right there. So this year, will you make a decision? First off, whatever situation, whatever circumstance, decide this year, man, I'm going to do what Jesus would do. I'm going to follow his example. I'm going to make a commitment like Jesus Preach the good news to the poor. Heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim freedom to the prisoners. Recovery of sight to the blind. Release the oppressed. These, This is our marching orders. That's why it's so important that we look at that at the start of the year. Because we don't ever want to get off, off this track. As a church, as individual Christians, we need to be willing to help people who this world has kicked and dragged through the mud. Right? The single mother who's been abandoned by her husband. The widower whose wife committed suicide. The drug addict whose pusher keeps calling him every day, trying to get him hooked again. The teenager whose parents kicked her out after she told him she was pregnant. The guy who's covered with tattoos and piercings. Listen, truth be told, truth be told, let's be real this morning. Most Christians, and actually most churches, sadly, are not willing to deal with those people. Many times, we want perfect people who come into church. Oh, they're dressed up nice. They come in carrying a leather-bound Bible. 
we have this very sanitized, very idealized person who belongs in church. And it's certainly not someone like we just talked about this morning. But Jesus says, no, these are the people I came for. I came for the sick, not the healthy. I came for those who are feeling crippled by their circumstances. Those who are hurting, those who are broken, untouchable. Who the world just passes by. And guess what? Sometimes those people are messy. And it's going to bring a little bit of a mess into our church. But that's okay because Jesus says, I will help you as you help them. Just do what I told you to do and watch what happens. And that's where our heart needs to be. I want to close with a story about a woman named Nicole Hornback. She was attending a local high school homecoming parade when she noticed her two-year-old son next to her was not saying anything, was totally quiet. And she realized he was choking on a piece of candy. And he wasn't making any noise. He was, And she just immediately tried to do the Heimlich maneuver on him. It didn't help. He was, tur he was turning purple now. And so she screamed out, my, my, my son is choking. Somebody help me. My son is choking. There was this girl um, who was on a, on, a, on a float in a parade, a cheerleader, okay, cheerleader, who's on this parade, and she's waving to the people in the crowd. And can you imagine, that's her. She hears this mother screaming out. She's on a parade. She's at this, you know, you think she's like, I'm supposed to, oh, somebody else will deal with it. Somebody else will take care of that, right? No, she jumps off the float, <laughs> jumps out of the parade, runs up to where this boy is choking, comes up behind him, gives him those like, uh, what do you call it, like things on the back, yeah. four blows on the back, out comes the candy. Yeah. Saved his life. Amen. The woman, every time I was like, you saved my child, you saved my child. And I looked at that and I thought, I, I so love that story. It's a very true story. And I thought, you know, we think about Jesus. Think about Jesus and when he's going through his life, going through his ministry, and, you know, he had very important things he was going through. He had, he had a schedule he was going on. But he always stopped and made time for people who, who were choking, dying. He always stopped and he went over and he helped them and he ministered to them. And God is saying, please, follow that example. That's the kind of Christian I want you to be. A Christian who's just following Jesus. That's the kind of church I want you to be, a church that follows Jesus, period. Amen? Amen. Why people don't need, I'm telling you, people today, they don't need, what they need today more than anything else this year, every year, is Jesus, period. Amen. That's it. They don't need a club. They don't need a you know, place to hang out as much as they need Jesus. They don't need a fancy sermon or a program or the right kind of music or class as much as they need Jesus. Right? They don't, they don't need to discuss doctrinal issues or debate theological ideas. They don't need to know who wrote the book of Isaiah, but they need Jesus. Amen. And when they come into our lives, into our churches, they ought to be able to find him. Amen. Amen. And so this year, every year, let's give people Jesus. Amen. Why do we do that? I found this. I thought it was good. Why do we do that? It's because... We have the good news, preaching brokenhearted, healing, captive freeing, prison breaking, mourner comforting, heaviness to praising, anointing of God because the spirit of the Lord is upon us. Amen. 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 So right now, if you would be getting your communion elements out, we're going to go right into it. Um, I mean, really, all the things that we looked at today, um, that we once were, poor, brokenhearted, in prison, oppressed, Jesus saved us. Jesus saved us. He healed us. He set us free. So God is just simply asking you and I today to do what he did for those people right now who are not yet free. And in doing that, we're following his example. We're following in his steps. And God is just saying, I will help you. I will fill you. I will empower you. And by the way, one of the reasons why we do communion every week like we do is because it's an opportunity for us to, yes, we reflect on what Jesus did for us. And then we can also determine again, Jesus, I want to recommit my life to you. I want to recommit to doing what you did in this world. I want to be your servant. 
I want to go out and just love and help and serve and minister just like he did. So Jesus is inviting us to this table to reflect on him and our calling to follow him again this year. Amen. So let's let the Lord. I said, and I pass it on to you just as I received it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until Jesus comes again. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Please be standing. We're going to sing in just a moment, but once again, I want us to just pray. And again, we're just asking God's comfort and strength to be with those who have lost loved ones, which including, by the way, is our own Pastor Scott lost his mother just recently. And so we want to pray for, for him and the family as well. So many that are going through hard times. Let's just invite the Lord to come. So God, thank you. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for the way, God, you minister to us when we need it the most. And Lord, again, this year, like every year, we want to be able to, to do what you did. We want to follow. We want to follow you, Lord. So we pray, God, we pray against distractions. We pray against anything that might hinder us from doing that. Lord, help us, as you said, in your word to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us, God, to just center on you this year, every year. Thank you for loving us. We praise you today, God. We adore you. We worship you. We bless you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Oh 
to be making their way up front. Please, prayer team, come on down. Don't be shy. So um, if anybody's needing any prayer, you can definitely get prayer here. Amen. But again, I, I just, I, I, we're, I was thinking about our, our sister, Mary Janice, and, you know, I have so many good memories of her, but I was thinking just most recently, I think it was either a couple of years ago, I was at a, a birthday party with her, and Mary Janice was I mean, even she, I mean, she she had they had cancer and was going through, but she was strong. She was a very strong woman. And at this birthday party, she brought a football, and she was like, "Let's go out and pass a football." <laughs> and I was like, "Sure, Mary, let's go out." And I mean, we were she was throwing it far. We just it's just such a good memory because she was so happy and smiling and just we were just having such a great time. But to know right now, that's exactly what she is. Just maybe she's throwing the football with Jesus. Who knows? Amen. But she is. She is in in the Lord's presence. She's worshiping God. We're so so grateful for that. So, once again, please come forward this morning if you need prayer. Maybe you're grieving the loss of a loved one. Maybe you've got some physical things happening in your body right now. You don't even understand. Maybe the doctors don't understand. God understands, and God will minister to you. So we want to pray with you and for you. God bless you. Have a great and wonderful day. Go Cowboys. Oh, yes. 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 Yes.